Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Brianna Taylor? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. In 2020, Brianna Taylor was an ER technician in Louisville, Kentucky. She lived in an apartment on Springfield Drive. She was romantically involved with a man named Jamarcus Glover, on and off from 2016 until February of 2020. He was a suspected drug dealer. Jamarcus would later say that Brianna was not involved in any drug dealing operations with him. But in another statement, he said that she handled his money. The money presumably was earned from selling drugs. So we see two different stories from him. After Brianna broke up with Jamarcus, she started seeing a man named Kenneth Walker. The Louisville Metro Police Department was very interested in the activities of Jamarcus as well as one of his alleged associates. They believe drugs or money relevant to the investigation may be stored at Brianna's apartment. Here was their justification for this theory. Jamarcus was at one time romantically connected to Brianna. A vehicle registered to Brianna was observed parked in front of a suspected drug house on several occasions. And Jamarcus was once spotted leaving her apartment with an unknown package. The police believed that the package contained drugs. The police obtained a no-knock search warrant, meaning they could force entry into the apartment without alerting the occupants. This was just one of five search warrants they applied for in connection with this case. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On March 13, 2020, a number of police officers arrived at Brianna's apartment just after midnight. They were wearing plain clothes. By this time, the search warrant had changed from a no-knock warrant to a knock and announce warrant. So their options had been restricted. They had to knock and identify themselves as police officers. Brianna Taylor and her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, were both in the apartment. The police officers knocked on the door, but there are different accounts as to whether they announced themselves. Kenneth Walker said that he and Brianna were in bed when they heard loud banging at the door. They both called out, asking who was at the door. Kenneth claimed that he was afraid that Brianna's ex-boyfriend was trying to break in. He called 911, and retrieved a legally owned pistol. After knocking, the police used a battering ram to break the door off of its hinges. At this point, Kenneth fired his pistol one time, striking a police officer named Jonathan Mattingly in the thigh. Three police officers returned fire. John Mattingly was one of them. He fired six shots into the apartment. An officer named Miles Cosgrove fired 16 shots, and an officer named Brett Hankinson fired 10 rounds blindly through a sliding glass door and a bedroom window. Both were covered by blinds or curtains. There was no way to see inside. The shots were fired in two waves, separated by one minute and eight seconds. Not a single bullet struck Kenneth Walker, but five rounds struck Brianna. The rounds that struck Brianna were fired by Miles Cosgrove. The other two officers did not hit anybody with their fire. Brianna Taylor went for 20 minutes without receiving medical attention. She would not survive. The coroner would later say that she probably died less than a minute after being shot. No drugs were found in the apartment. Kenneth Walker was charged with attempted murder of a police officer, but the charges were eventually dismissed with prejudice, meaning he can never be charged again in this case. Miles Cosgrove and Brett Hankinson were eventually fired, as was the police officer who prepared the search warrant. Jonathan Mattingly would end up retiring in 2021. Brett Hankinson was charged with three counts of wanton endangerment. Three of the rounds he fired actually penetrated into another apartment that was occupied. None of the officers who were fired were charged in connection with Brianna Taylor's death. A civil suit was settled in favor of Brianna's estate. It was for $12 million. On March 3, 2022, Brett Hankinson was found not guilty on all charges. Now moving to my analysis. 
I will review the items in this case that stood out to me. Item number one, the police officer suggested that they knocked on the door of the apartment before breaking the door in. At first, they knocked gently, but then over the course of about 90 seconds, their knocking became increasingly forceful and loud. They also claimed that they did announce themselves. Many neighbors said they didn't hear the police knock or announce themselves. However, considering that Kenneth Walker remembers them knocking, it is reasonable to believe that they did knock. The issue is really about the announcement. Did it really happen? This is a question that could be easily answered with body camera footage. The only problem is none of the police officers recorded any of the confrontation. These officers seem offended that nobody believes them, yet they didn't even make the most basic effort to remain transparent. Item number two, Kenneth Walker called 911 as the incident was occurring. Just after the shots were fired, he told the dispatcher, quote, somebody kicked in the door and shot my girlfriend, unquote. From Kenneth Walker's point of view, one could certainly argue he was within his rights to fire on who he believed to be intruders. There's a situation here where you have these people in plain clothes banging on the door, then breaking it off its hinges. One man charges in the house holding a gun. Nobody says anything about being a police officer, at least according to Kenneth. The police were behaving like hostile intruders, yet they were offended because Kenneth Walker responded as if they were hostile intruders. Item number three is how the officers returned fire. Just because Kenneth Walker may have been justified in defending himself doesn't mean the officers did not have the right to return fire. Jonathan Mattingly, for example, was shot in the leg. He was probably afraid for his life. Anybody in this situation would have fired back. He was not necessarily at fault in the situation, as he was not the one who prepared the search warrant. He was just doing his job. He probably believed that he and his fellow officers were behaving responsibly. Perhaps he just received misinformation. This appears to be a situation where both Kenneth Walker and the police had the right to use deadly force in that moment. One would hope that following the law would avoid situations like this, like one party should be in the right, and the other party should be in the wrong, but that is not always the case. When moving to Miles Cosgrove, culpability becomes a little more complex. Yes, he may have had the right to return fire, but firing 16 shots and striking an innocent person five times is not responsible. Also, what happened to marksmanship? What's the point of firing the weapon if he did not know how to identify and hit the target? The right to return fire doesn't give him the right to fire indiscriminately. As far as Brett Hankinson, his behavior makes absolutely no sense. He blindly fired his weapon 10 times through the sliding glass door and window. For all he knew, the apartment could have been packed with people. Did he graduate from the Spray and Pray Firearm Academy? Or maybe he dropped out of training before he had the class covering how to hit the target. Like he thought all he needed to do was simply pull the trigger a bunch of times and the bad guys would automatically surrender. Brett claimed to believe there was a perpetrator in the apartment with an AR-style weapon. This is amazing considering he didn't see anybody holding any type of weapon at all. It is certainly possible to identify some types of firearms just by hearing them, but it's hard to believe that this particular officer knew how to do that, considering his level of firearm skill demonstrated throughout this incident. Brett was found not guilty of wanton endangerment, but I think the jury made a mistake here. No officer is ever justified in discharging a weapon when they have no idea where the bullets are going to travel. This was extremely reckless and endangered everyone in the situation, including his fellow officers. Item number four, police officers who join high action units like this are not typically upset about these types of assignments. Rather, they are looking for thrills and adventure. They want an adrenaline rush. It would seem that these officers created a danger that did not exist, or at least one of them did, perhaps in part to satisfy a need for excitement. For example, they decided to execute a search warrant at night. They were not wearing body cameras, so no accountability, and they were wearing plain clothes. Even though the no-knock warrant was eventually converted to a knock-and-announce warrant, I think it's telling that the initial application was for a no-knock warrant. That only makes the situation more exhilarating 
and dangerous. High sensation seekers live for this type of experience. This was probably supposed to be a fun time for these officers. This is what they look forward to. Sometimes there is a thin line between pro-social and antisocial behavior, and some officers live to walk that line. Item number five, after Brianna Taylor was killed, the police tried to make it seem like perhaps she was involved in the criminal activity. Reportedly, they offered a plea deal to Jamarcus Glover to implicate Brianna in his crimes. He refused. This is a great example of the police mentality. They kill an innocent person, yet instead of taking ownership of their behavior, they pretend the victim was the perpetrator. It amazes me that some police departments are confused as to why the public does not trust them. Now moving to my final thoughts. This case was really about a number of armed intruders who caused the death of an innocent, unarmed woman who was legally in her own residence. The police may have had some reason to suspect there would be drugs or money in Breonna Taylor's apartment, but they used just about the most dangerous method they could think of to search the apartment. There was simply no need for that level of aggression. An insatiable desire for excitement creates a cost that innocent people end up paying. Those are my thoughts on the case of Breonna Taylor. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.